You know, I'm gonna give you a history lesson. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. <laughs> <laughs> start laughing! <laughs> and when I do, start <laughs> Also, y'all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass, too. Funny jokes and unfunny jokes come out of the same birth. You fing guys are unbelievable. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. And today, I am pleased to present to you the downfall of Will Ferrell. Now, this may seem like a misleading title, only in the sense that Will Ferrell has never really left like the public consciousness. He was just in, you know, one of the highest grossing movies of, of the year, if not ever, uh, the goddamn Barbie movie that you can't stop hearing about. But it is weird to see Will Ferrell in a role that, like, didn't make that big a difference. They could have gotten a lot of people to play the head of Mattel and Barbie. Like, that's not what Will Ferrell was. What he was, when I was a kid, was the biggest comedy star in the world. Like, he was one of my guys, the way, you know, Jim Carrey and Adam Sandler were for a generation, or Bill Murray or Chevy Chase. or Like, people around my age, that was Will Ferrell. Uh, he was a massive, massive star. And then all of a sudden, he, he kind of became... I've never heard him as a joke, but it is a, a, at a point now where, like, if Will Ferrell's in something, you almost roll your eyes and you expect it to be bad, yeah. which is bizarre to me as a kid that grew up on, uh, you know, him on SNL, uh, Anchorman, obviously, Talladega Nights, like all those movies that I love so much. So we will get into why uh, that kind of became Will Ferrell's reputation. Because um, when this was, uh, the, the Warthog actually suggested this as an idea to me a while back. And at the time, I was like, I don't know if there's really enough to talk about. And then the more I started looking into it, it's like, oh, there's a lot of points uh, that you can look at as to why Will Ferrell's career dipped off the way that it did. Um, so we will get into that today. But first, I want to tell you about a little website called blindmike.net, really more of a link tree uh, <laughs> that makes it easy for you guys to navigate everything going on with this show, Blind Mike Projects, W-A-T-S. If you're looking for the links of uh, the podcasts that I host then blindmike.net is where you go. You can also become a Patreon or YouTube member. That's where you get early access to these episodes. Um, you know, why Why be a sucker and wait around? You could have had this a week early. And you get uh, bonus content as well. So make sure you check out blindmike.net. Easiest, easiest place to find all of our links if uh, you'd be so kind as to support the show. And if you want to support the show for free, just leave comments, likes, all that helps uh, get the show out there. If you're on YouTube, interact engage with the show and it gets more people watching these episodes um and thank you to those who have done that so blindmike.net all right uh so we will start i mean will ferrell's career got off to a pretty quick start where he was in the groundlings i don't know why i always thought he was a second city guy um uh, but he grew up in the los angeles area started at the groundlings and that's where a ton of people came uh from snl i think he said his class was like uh, Maya Rudolph and um, Anna Gasteyer, like a lot of people that ended up on the show. So uh, his audition is thought of as one of the best, which is funny because what I always heard was like, you know, people never laugh in the SNL auditions and right. Will Ferrell got people to laugh. So you kind of go in expecting like uproarious laughter. Even this, which is one of the more legendary ones, you kind of hear like one guy off in the distance giggling a little bit. Yeah, he probably so that's, got that's, shot a, that's how tough a room it was. Yeah, yeah no, because I, I used to watch these all the time on YouTube, but I actually yeah. had um, the best of Will Ferrell SNL DVD, and this was on it, and that was the first time I saw it. Yeah. And uh, this part we have is actually, I thought, like, maybe the funniest thing he ever did on the show. And then, <laughs> well, get, give, give credit to improv people too, because like, Stand up when you're bombing, I think, is one thing. You're up there telling jokes that aren't getting laughs. Improv people, if, if you aren't getting laughs, you're a person up there doing a silly character. <laughs> like, at least yeah. in stand up, you're bombing as yourself. You're just right. a guy who's not getting a reaction. This is like, hey, what if what if George Bush and Jack Nicholson were in a Mercedes together? <laughs> <laughs> so you feel very silly so it's i i would assume much more difficult uh to bomb an improv so, or, or not even bomb but just not get a reaction you know because to get out of the bomb i think is probably harder right because i remember so, um 
uh, Dane Cook was talking about, he was in an improv group like Bobby Kelly and stuff. Alan the Monkeys. Yeah, and he used to talk about how if they did bomb that he would just sabotage the rest of the performance. Um, Melissa McCarthy did that too, where she said she was doing some improv thing and it was bombing. And she thought the funniest thing was to just somersault away and leave everyone else up there. (laughs) 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 But uh, yeah, let's hear a little of Will Ferrell's uh, SNL audition. This uh, This is Dutch Litchford. And we're at an outdoor barbecue. Hey, the Taylors are here. Hey, come on back. Yeah, come on back. Everybody, the party can start. The Taylors are here. Hey, how are you? Yeah. Hi, June. Yeah. Oh, get that award-winning potato salad away from me. Yeah, no, Connie's in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Brandon, Michael, you want to do me a favor and get off the shed? Okay? I need you to be a buddy and get off the shed. All right? Hey, Don, how are you? Yeah. Hey, I've got a story for you. I finally played a Hillcrest. Shot a 93. Ouch. No, I'll take it. I'm not a scratch golfer like you, though. Hey, hey, guys, I mean it. Let's get off the shed. Okay? <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you, I lost uh, four balls off that first tee. Yeah, no, no. I, I took a 12, and uh, I was fine after that. But, boy, you're right. That hole's a... If you don't get off the shed in two seconds, I'm going to shove the spatula into orifices you didn't know you had. Now get off the shed. But uh, yeah, it was a t- anybody <laughs> want a burger? Who wants a burger? These are just about just about done here. Get off the goddamn shed! <laughs> off the shed! We got hot dogs too, if you want. Yeah, who wants anybody want a hot dog? Or you don't eat pork, do you? Yeah, no. <laughs> and that's I mean that's vintage. Like that's old school Will Ferrell. That's uh, vintage Will Ferrell. That's what he was great at. Was both was becoming. Um, you know, it was being like the mild mannered guy that became the maniac. <laughs> right. And I, that, that's, I guess, kind of what he was um, on set. We'll hear Adam McKay talk about it a little but um, So Will Ferrell, the story was a little too long for me to use the whole clip, but I heard him telling the story of uh, what's known as like the briefcase story from his audition. And I guess he heard that Adam Sandler, like in Lauren Michaels, started fucking the chair. <laughs> And Lauren saw, thought it was so funny that he just hired him on the spot. So I guess Will Ferrell hearing stories like that was like, well, I got to do something that makes me stand out in this essentially interview in Lauren Michaels' office. So he goes in uh, with a briefcase full of like fa- funny money, fake money, like like from a Monopoly game or something like that. And his plan was to, at some point during the meeting, open the briefcase and say, Lauren, I think you and I both know what really talks and putting a stack of money on his desk, <laughs> which is kind of, which is a funny bit. Like he's unloading the briefcase to Lauren Michaels and the, the meeting just went as such that he never had an opportunity to do it. So he left it. And then the next time he goes in with the briefcase and the secretary was like, Oh, leave your briefcase out here. You don't need that. And he was like, uh, no, that's okay. I and she's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. So he left the briefcase outside again. <laughs> And then eventually Lauren Michaels found out about that and thought it was such a great, like he loved that story so much <laughs> <laughs> that he never got to do it. <laughs> but, but yeah, he was a guy that was like constantly doing bits like that, but I don't think it was what it became later that we'll hear about. So is our next clip, uh, Adam McKay? That sure is. So this was obviously uh, Will Ferrell's writing partner, the guy that made uh, many great films and other content with Will Ferrell. Uh, let's hear about their relationship. I mean, it started uh, in the funniest way. I mean, it really just started. We all thought he was the straight man on the show. He's such uh, an unassuming guy. He's not a guy who's trying to be funny when he meets you. Kector, myself, Giannis, Tim Met, all of us are just doing bits nonstop. I mean, we're just a force of, and Colin Quinn and everyone. You're at Saturday Live. Right. We're all trying to make each other laugh. Farrell's just not. He's just really calm, and he's kind of funny sometimes. And then the first read-through, we all have our sketches, and this guy who just seemed like the blandest guy uncorks it in a way that you just cannot believe it. And it has, like, five of the funniest sketches I've ever heard in my life, and he's doing characters, and we all just look at each other and go, where the hell did that come from? 
Meanwhile, Laura, meanwhile, Will was jealous of us doing bits all the time. He wanted to be doing bits with us. He later told me this. So he started gravitating towards us and like doing bits with us. Because he's from Groundlings and you guys are all from Second City, Iowa. Second IO, City. And Chicago. he felt like he had lost a little something not being from Second City, like that we had heavier improv. And he just loved the bits. So pretty soon he just started coming in our office and he was hanging out with us. And then he would start doing bits. And we'd be like, this guy's really good at bits. And he would play him real <laughs> deadpan. And then all of a sudden we'd be like, wait a minute, this guy's really good at bits. And finally one day we wrote a sketch together and it was just so much fun. Neither one of us had a ton of drama about it. We made each other laugh. We put the sketch up and it killed. It was uh, Neil Diamond Storytellers. This guy's and really good at bits. <laughs> it was, the, the, he used the word bits so many times that it was getting a little exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's really good at bits. <laughs> it's uh... but, but, that sounds uh, like an improv dork. <laughs> <laughs> they were uh, they were hired on the same day, and I think Adam McKay said basically he uh, auditioned to be on the show, even though he kind of he knew he wasn't really a performer, and went up to Lauren Michaels afterwards and just said, "Here's my writing. You probably would rather hire me as a writer." And that's how McKay got hired. Um, so him and Farrell get brought in at the same time. They start writing together, and. Uh, magic was made as we'll get to it's not being made today anymore but we'll talk about that later um but it, it was interesting to hear him talk about that because uh will ferrell was a shy timid guy when they started uh ferrell said like they all went out to a bar together on their first day mckay ferrell a couple other people and will ferrell said he said maybe three words and then he started feeling himself a little more at some point at saturday night live um particularly i guess he became um one of if not the highest paid um cast member ever uh towards the end of his time there which was not a ton of money they were talking about it on stern uh how much would you guess the highest paid snl cast members making in a year i'm only guessing this because i think i heard it but i could be wrong wasn't it like 100 oh no it was three hundred fifty thousand. Oh really? But but still, like for a, a show that big, and I guess the logic is it's on eleven thirty on Saturdays, so it's not a yeah, prime time show. But it is still, still yeah. these guys aren't what what you're there for for SNL is what Will Ferrell did is right. getting a massive movie career, you know? Right. And like uh, the show itself, even still with it being terrible, everyone knows what it is. Everyone kind of oh, will sure. check it out either. And on yeah, TV I mean, even TV. now, millions of views on YouTube the next morning, yeah. all that stuff. So yeah. Um, but yeah, Will Ferrell was a guy, uh, as you heard, big on bits and, uh, boy, did he get into those during his, uh, later days at SNL. <laughs> we have Actually, a... this can't be that late if Quinn, yeah, if Colin Quinn early. and Jim Brewer were still there. It can't be that late in his time. It was definitely early on. So sure. this story, this, I would have done an episode just about this story. If I could, it's one of my <laughs> favorite stories ever. It's great. But this is Brewer basically saying, so, um, Will Ferrell eventually would stay in character um not even necessarily a character he was playing it's not like he was the cheerleader guy or george bush all day it was uh the early days of ron burgundy before ron burgundy was uh, anchorman and they could not get him out of character and it was bothering some of the cast members so this is uh, jim brewer on howard stern telling this story so when he was in character would he act like he even knew you no so me tracy and C colin is like dude this guy's really pissed me off. <laughs> you know, serious, no character, no fucking, a little flamboyant gay guy. <laughs> really fucking aggravated. And he would come around <laughs> pretend he's selling this art. So me and Tracy and Colin, like, you know what? <laughs> why don't we go in character? And why don't we do? So we went into his room and he's like, are you interested in art? And this went on for two weeks. He wore these glasses. <laughs> oh, my God. With, with, with um, a pink shirt. Like a gay character. Yes. Right. But he was flamboyant. But he wasn't really gay. He was flamboyant. Right. So Colin's like, let's let's bring him to our room and we'll gang rape him. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's right. He's in character. I said, we'll go in character. We'll I bet you he'll break character during the gang rape. Well, yeah. This is our mission. Right. Our mission is like, let's see if we can break him. So me and Colin lure him <laughs> towards our room. He comes in the room. We instantly throw him down. Right. Colin's pulling his pants off. <laughs> Colin's trying to, I'm doing the fake in the face. Oh, I can't get you. You can make a cock? 
I didn't take it. I took down the underwear. Right. And I'm rubbing against his head. <laughs> You're rubbing and, your underwear against his head? But this is the part that was the, the funniest. <laughs> Tracy <laughs> is in the doorway right. with a cigarette. He's going, save someone out for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just look out. <laughs> save someone out for me. <laughs> and the whole time, Will's going, oh, the horror. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Come to my aid! Please don't let this continue. And he would he not just break character. Would not break character. You're rubbing. <laughs> Such, I mean, like he he could almost be lying because of the tone he has for Tracy Morgan and uh, Will Ferrell <laughs> being in character as Ron Burgundy is so perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it almost sounds like fan fiction. <laughs> and that might be the best Colin Quinn impression I've ever heard. Jay Moore does a great one. That's true. But, uh, but yeah, but yeah, like, and th that's such a a perfect story for all of them because it is something that would annoy the shit out of Colin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that this guy will not break character, and uh, if it if it confused you at all, what I said about Ron Burgundy, the ca the character was named every character he did was named Ron Burgundy, I guess at this time, but it wasn't like the Anchorman character. So this one was like an art salesman or something. <laughs> uh, but I guess that's just where that name came from, and. It is a little bit the way he stays in character there. Help somebody come to my aid. That is, it felt to me like almost a story you hear about a guy getting made in the mafia. Like, well, if he could endure this, then we'll just let yeah. him be that way, you know? <laughs> like, Tracy just being like, save someone out for me is like the funniest it's shit. It's great. But yeah, like the, the idea that he wouldn't break, it's like, oh, he was really committed to this and it's almost admirable. That he would like that seems like a moment where anyone else would be like, "All right, guys, Jesus, I'm sorry." Like, and then complain about them years later. Will Ferrell was 100 percent committed to this. Yeah, and, <laughs> and that was the beauty of it. But I will say, this is our first uh, our first signs of of cracking for Will Ferrell, in my opinion, because that's an, an example. While it's a hilarious story, it's an example of him being kind of exhausting. Yeah, you know like, what I mean. Like we talked about this with Chevy Chase a little bit, where like I would watch Chevy Chase on interviews and think to myself, "Boy, people must have gotten sick of that bit." To use the word again, the where it's like because it kind of became in these interviews, that, like the uh, you know Tonight Show and stuff like that, that I was watching of him, it started to be predictable. Where it's like, "Oh, he's not going to really answer this question," you know, he's going to give some offbeat and pretend to not know what you're talking about. Um. And as the more I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, I guess it did get exhausting because Chevy Chase became less popular. Now, the difference would be Chevy Chase was also tremendously difficult to work with, by all accounts. Right. Like, he's considered one of the biggest assholes in show business. Will Ferrell doesn't have that reputation at all. Um, but I just think from an audience perspective, he became very... We started to see that in real life. Uh, not in real life, but in, you know what I mean, like on TV and stuff, in these appearances, where we never saw him being Ron Burgundy behind the scenes at SNL. But over the years, as he gained more popularity and became more and more exposed, we did see that stuff in commercials he would do, in uh, late night appearances. And we, yeah. have a lot of we have a lot of examples of that. But I do think that mentality of him never breaking and wanting to just confuse people and annoy them, I think that contributes to what we think of Will Ferrell as now. Yeah, and it's a lot like uh, Jim Carrey with Man on the Moon. Everyone would just be like, oh, my fucking God, here we go. <laughs> but you know what? I, yes, there's some of that. But I will say, like, that story is fun. The fact that he would put up with that. Yes. Whereas it seemed like Jim Carrey would have thrown a hissy fit based yeah. on that documentary. <laughs> I'm still trying to think of funny things to say while potentially being R-worded is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody come to my aid. <laughs> Jim Brewer... Uh, uh, on Howard or Opie and Anthony just has the best stories. He had a lot. He had a lot of great stories. Yeah, if you're if you're uh, not familiar with Jim Brewer, Google uh, or search on YouTube Jim Brewer, Opie and Anthony, Pizza Man. It's a great that, story. Or Jim uh, Jim Brewer, uh, Lars Ulrich, the drummer from Metallica. He goes out yeah. and parties with him. Is one of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but back to Will Ferrell. But back to Will Ferrell. Uh, we have the Frat Pack. Yeah, this is him talking about that crew of guys a little bit. So Will Ferrell, still on SNL when he did um, Old School, I believe, but started to become a big star at the same time that like Ben Stiller, Owen Wilson, Luke Wilson, Vince Vaughn, all these guys started to pop off a little bit. They became known as the Fret Pack. 
feral camp. Are you guys friends? Do you do you talk? I mean, do you know that you're all? It's gets very heated. Yeah, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> there was that scene in a in the first anchor man right where you had the the fight. Yeah, where it almost seemed like that was playing off on the idea of these two camps of comedy. Well, you know that. Um, actually, there was a time. It doesn't happen anymore, really. Yeah. But there really was a time where. Uh, we would go and do read throughs of each other's scripts. So, you know, I went and read on a script for Ben. Ben came and I remember he read. The, oh, really? Yeah. We would actually kind of. Uh, there was all, communication. There was communication. Yeah. And there was like a sense of, you know, camaraderie. camaraderie and actually appreciation uh -huh. of, of everyone's work. Uh -huh. And then everyone kind of became huge huge and too busy and that's really yeah. what it is a lot yeah, of times yeah, yeah. people read into things like they yeah. don't talk to each other right. they have families and they're, yeah, they're totally. making movies yeah. what, do you, yeah, yeah. what do you think their people are doing yeah. it's like um you know what i was thinking i said old school but i was actually thinking of uh, zoolander which it surprised me um when i re i didn't realize zoolander came out in 2001 yeah so that's still like will ferrell's not even really a star yet and yeah. he's play he's playing the villain in a, a what became uh, a pretty massive comedy huge and he did um uh old school which was during snl and uh night at the roxbury which was a snl movie which yeah is... night at the roxbury what like you know I, th I don't think it's looked back on too fondly no but it was a hit at the time <laughs> at the time it definitely was yeah um but yeah so this is another factor a little bit i think and, and he still had adam mckay of course but the idea that he wasn't working with these guys anymore because that's unfortunately what happens and it's amazing that sandler just kept his crew together forever <laughs> but like uh you know ben stiller massive owen wilson he had his own problems but got to be very big vince vaughn obviously became huge will ferrell probably the biggest of that group although i could argue ben stiller but um like all these guys have their own careers so it's going to be very difficult to get them in a movie you might have something like wedding crashers well where will ferrell makes a cameo but the idea of all of them being in the same movie becomes more and more difficult over the years uh so i do think that's another factor that presents itself where it's like these guys that he kind of came up with um you know they all go their different ways basically yep and um we have a man here talking about doing serious roles yeah, so he did want to show himself um, as a, a guy who's funny but can also do, you know, more more dramatic roles. There's a Stranger Than Fiction, um, Everything Must Go. There's a few times where he played serious roles. And I think here he's talking with Marin about there's um, Vince Gilligan did some uh dramatic reading of a script he'd been working on that he'd been trying to get made for 18 years i guess um i still don't think it's been made i've at least i've never heard of it but um he, they, they were doing some uh reading for this in front of an audience and he's talking about that idea of uh the audience receiving him playing a more serious role and this is a guy like the the role that will ferrell was playing was a uh, racist so it's kind of jarring the audience a little bit how are you not gonna like i think you're one of those guys like see like even with me sitting yeah. here talking to right, you right, right. i know you from uh you know films and television yeah uh that i you know there's part of me that's sort of waiting to laugh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and and yeah. i have to assume that when you get in no, i'm not saying you no. there's no pressure no no i know no i'm gonna I'm laugh gonna... even out of context <laughs> <laughs> okay like, i'm gonna laugh no matter what right 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 but I imagine when you do something like that, yes, like no matter how soon you could be doing, you know, something be, dark and horrible and people are right. like, and then it, and then, <laughs> and that's kind of what happened yesterday. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of lang you know, there's a lot of language in this movie mm -hmm. where um, it's basically about these racist group of guys yeah. who, um, who kind of realize that th th all this hate isn't, isn't doing anyone any good, but right. But to say the N word and all these things and the audience went from laughing to, Oh, wait a minute and uh oh really yeah it kind of stopped them in their tracks which was kind of fun <laughs> for me <laughs> to say the n-word <laughs> well but i like that i like the idea that he likes kind of doing things that make the audience go like what the fuck but what stood out to me about that was enough of those over time then the audience just starts saying like oh this is a guy that just does weird shit <laughs> like yeah. i have, I have yeah. no interest in participating with this you know like yeah. once in a, once in a while okay but if it's 
if it becomes everything you do is just on your own terms to make the audience be like, what the fuck is this? Then you beca- your, your reputation just becomes a guy where we think like, oh, he's doing something I don't care about or I think is weird, you know? Yeah. So like, I, I respect the the mentality behind it that he doesn't care if he's if he's bombing or if he's perceived as doing something that's you know uh, beneath him or out of his range or whatever like i respect that idea but i do think enough of those over time because he talks about uh we're going to talk about the spanish movie that he did but he also talked about like the old milwaukee commercials that he did um i think as ron burgundy he might have done those um but like a bunch of these like little things that he did that maybe a guy of of his level it wouldn't be advised for him to do he took a lot of risks the problem with that is when risks don't really work or don't pay off then you become a guy who just people stop giving a fuck about yeah hence our next uh little chunk here is just the ron burgundy stuff that never ends Ron Burgundy became a lot. Yeah. Which one's the, is this the um, Sports Center or is this the yep, podcast? Sports sport Center. Yeah. So we'll play this and I'll tell you a little more about it because it's not even so much Ron Burgundy's involvement with Sports Center, but this was like a thing that he filmed with uh, ESPN. Uh, what is the name of this network again? Uh, ES- Eston? No, no, ESPN. That's a terrible name. Hello, sports fans. I'm Ron Burgundy here at the desk of Espen. And there were some things going on in sports today that will make your brain fall out of your skull. We go next to Wrigley Field, where the Astros and the Cubs got together and had a crazy idea. Let's play two games in one day. Something that (laughs) had never been done before in the history of baseball. So let's go to college sports. The University of Notre Dame announced today that it will change its mascot from the Fighting Irish to the Fighting Doberman Pinscher Genitalias. Students were outraged at the okay. news. That, what? That wasn't a story that we had on the prompter. Well, of course. I made it up because I've got nothing here. You're giving me baseball and hockey, and I got my keister blowing in the wind. I made that made to look like a fool here. It's sport. So, so there's a couple of things around the re, the reason I wanted to focus on ESPN is because it's not even it's not that clip or the things he filmed as Ron Burgundy. But he did a lot of stuff. He's like a big sports fan. So there were a lot, I remember like He'd be on Sports Center talking about USC. I remember him being on with Snoop Dogg, and he would go on the college game day and all this stuff. And it became to a point where, you know, maybe the first time I saw it as a kid, I was like, oh shit, Will Ferrell's on Sports Center. Let me stick around for this. Later it became, oh God, he's on Sports Center again. <laughs> you know, like, why is he doing this? It became exhausting. I think that's going to be the word of the day for a lot of Will Ferrell's stuff. But, the other, the other aspect of it is not his fault. So Anchorman, one of my favorite movies as a kid, there's become this like cheese around it. It's become like a, 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 you almost think of it as a corny movie, much like Caddyshack. So Caddyshack as a kid, I heard quoted so much that when I finally watched it, I didn't find it funny because every funny quote in it <laughs> You have heard people say 10 million fucking times, and they killed it. It's not Caddyshack's fault. It's the people that, you know, develop a movie as their personality, you know? Right. And to be, to be fair, I quote Seinfeld 90 times a day, so I'm guilty of this as well. But uh, with uh, Anchorman, it became every, you know, morning zoo show, like sports talk radio shows, had Ron Burgundy drops. God forbid the Patriots were playing the Chargers. Because you would hear San Diego 10 million times. Um, and like in their calls, like sports center anchors would say, and whammy, and all that. T- like there yeah. were anchorman quotes littered through. I specifically focus on sports center, but it was like news anchors. I don't think got that this was a anchorman was a decimation of them specifically. Yeah, I think. Uh, I was going to say, I think this movie had the same problem Billy Madison did, where it was so quotable, it just pissed everyone off to no end. It just got, much like Will Ferrell, it got overexposed eventually, where you hear it over and over again, and then you're like, all right, we got it. Will's vagina, we understand. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, the other thing is, like, he, it, it, that character was not at its core 
was not supposed to be something that was done over and over again. Like what Ron Burgundy was, was literally a one note vapid guy, like completely shallow. Like there was nothing to him. That was the joke. So to make a second movie out of that, a podcast, which we'll get to, <laughs> um, commercials, like do all these other side projects with Ron Burgundy. To me, that doesn't make any sense because you're stretching out this character that was supposed to be one note. That was, the whole idea was that it was one note. It was perfect for an hour and a half movie, not mm -hmm. hours and hours of content, you know? Not, not life. <laughs> no, well, like even in there, <clears throat> there's a couple lines that might deserve a laugh, but it's like, well, you know, the whole thing with Ron Burgundy is he's going to say something quirky and offbeat. So now it becomes unexpected. I mean, I'm sorry, it becomes expected. What was supposed right. to be unexpected becomes expected. Right. The uh, the next clip wasn't him as Ron Burgundy talking about the podcast. Should I just play that one? Is it kind um, of no, well, let's go in order. I've got a very specific order. In mind. Okay. Uh, here we are, they are talking about The Office. Yeah, so the uh, this is uh, the Warthog mentioned this to me. He said, uh, do you think The Office was the, the start of his downfall? And at first I thought, no. And then in this clip, I think Will Ferrell mentioned something that actually might be the reason <laughs> for his downfall it might it might actually be like this might be the pivotal moment in will ferrell's um demise so let's hear him talk to the office ladies here is a question we ask all of our guests how did you get your job on the office i got my job on the office i had called up my peeps mm-hmm yeah. My, my representation. No, I just thrown it out that I knew it was Steve's last year. And I just said, God, I would love to do something in that last season. My agent called me back and said, oh, yeah, they're thrilled. In fact, they want to know. Greg was like, would you actually want to do a whole arc? But that's what I was alluding to when I didn't talk to many people on the set because those last shows were emotionally charged and you guys were all having a moment. I'm like, what am I doing here? I shouldn't be here. <laughs> you, I, have I, I was always like, Oh my God, everyone's crying. Here's another read through. Everyone's going to cry. And uh... <laughs> So I think he's exactly right. He should not have been there for that. It didn't really dawn on me that that would have an impact. But when he said that, I was like, you know what? People think of those now. And like, you'll hear people talk about the post Corel office and refer with disgust to the Will Ferrell episodes. And the office is a show like with Steve Carell. The office is a show that people love so much. It's had, it's been more popular since it ended than it was when it was on the air. Yeah. Uh, so people oh, yeah. have the, people have this, this love for the show and particularly that character, Michael Scott. And when you're watching his goodbye, you are thinking, why is Will Ferrell? He shouldn't be there. And I don't know if they could have done it in a way where, where Will Ferrell comes in after, like the next episode, or even there's one, like the final scene is Carell passing it off to Will Ferrell or something. Because I do think if Will Ferrell just straight up replaced Steve Carell, I think that could have been funny. And at the time, I think you kind of look at that as beneath Will Ferrell, but in hindsight, it wasn't. So that maybe could have been something. I think Will Ferrell would probably be too big of a personality when mm -hmm. that was more of an ensemble show. Um, but the idea that Will Ferrell was kind of interrupting, like even in the song they sing to Carell, if you think it's cheesy or whatever, but like they, they sing this song to him. Will Ferrell has a line in that song. And you're just thinking like, this is not what that, he shouldn't be there. Like Dwight isn't in that scene and Will Ferrell is, you know? Right, but it it does sound like he realized it when it was too late. Oh, I mean, but, I'm, but again, like th this is uh, if it sounds like I'm bashing Will Ferrell in this episode, which I understand the title. That's kind of the whole point. This well, is like, no Seinfeld episode. He's he's way more aware of this stuff than I thought he would be. Yeah, like even in that Marin episode, I was surprised he did Marin because I was like, oh, it's going to be all. It's going to be all bits, as we heard Adam McKay say over and over again. The guy loves bits. Yeah. He's com completely normal in that. Like, he's perfectly, and he's very honest about a lot of the stuff in his career. Like, it's actually a good interview. And mm -hmm. that's the case in most of his, his interviews. Like, I've seen him with 
uh, he was on, you know, Charlie Rose and shows like that, where he's being a totally regular guy, you know? Yeah. Um, so I was, I was surprised by that. So it's more like, yeah, this is not uh, like in the, uh, in Seinfeld funny episode, I, I, I get annoyed at Jerry's philosophies <laughs> and the way he speaks about, uh, certain things in comedy. Will Ferrell, that's not the case. I actually like love the guy and would like him to be in a funny movie again. I think he will be. Um, we'll see. Uh, next, we have him talking about Casa de Mi Padre. Yeah, so this is the... the, the he did a movie, if you're not aware of this. He did uh, a movie entirely in Spanish called Casa de Mi Padre. And um, he's talking about the success of that, uh, or lack thereof. My altruistic... I actually thought it would work. You thought that commercially in Latin America, uh, even here. Yeah. But which it did not, but, uh, <laughs> but yes, it was just a thing that I, I, for five years, I had this idea of putting myself in a Spanish language movie and committing to speaking Spanish <laughs> as well as I possibly could, as uh, opposed to the joke of, of, Oh, he speaks poor Spanish. And just what would that look like if, did you speak Spanish? Someone from American comedy would just appear in that world. Um, just from my high school Spanish. So you had but, to study and so, you know, no, I had to, no, I had to work ferociously with a translator every uh -huh. day. And do you speak Spanish now? No. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about where it's like, Hey, wouldn't that be hilarious if I put out a movie where I'm entirely speaking Spanish and it's like, as, as an idea, as a sketch, maybe? Yes, that'd be very funny. But the fact of the matter is, he put out a movie all in Spanish, and all it did was make people think, like, why is he doing this? It's kind of like Segura's uh, stand-up in Spanish. <laughs> well, you but at least that's for an audience that speaks Spanish, you know? Right, right. <laughs> like, he's just doing his act in Spanish, whereas this is like, oh, that's funny, he's doing a movie in Spanish. Are you going to go see it? No, of course not. I can't, I don't speak the language. I bet that movie would do much better now because there's like a good amount of movies coming out on Netflix that get pretty popular that are all subtitled. Um, well, I mean, the movie also has to be good. That's the problem. Yeah, issue. but, no, I, know, but, but, I, yeah, but I, don't, I don't know. Maybe. But my, my point is more the mentality of like following through with an idea that like, yeah, if he was just if he said that in the interview to Mark Marin. I, I've been thinking about doing a movie entirely in Spanish. You'd be like, oh, that's kind of funny. But am I going to go see it? No. no. <laughs> I think that started to become the issue with uh, some of Will Ferrell's stuff. That would be one of those movies that you're like, all right, let me check the, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. Like, let me check the reviews, and if they're good, I'll go see it. Right. But uh, next we have him just talking about box office bombs. So this, I mean, this is where, like, he gets very honest, like I said. But <laughs> I, I also didn't realize there were bombs. In my mind, it was... Hit, 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 like just monster hit. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden he fell off. That's not really the case. He won a couple Razzies, which I didn't realize. Uh, I guess even kicking and screaming was considered a bomb. Yeah. The I think that there's like some funny stuff in that movie. At least when I, I don't think I was that young, but like for kids, it's a good kids movie for sure. Yeah. This one he's about to mention, I remember watching when it came out. And being like, this stinks. <laughs> yeah, Land, of, Land of the Lost is one where I was like, oof. And I remember Bewitched, like Family Guy made a joke about Correct. Bewitched. <laughs> like like that was just that was like a notorious bomb of his. Um, and he talks about those here with Marin. Okay. My logic is it's like, all right, he's in it. <laughs> so it's gonna cost me what 12 bucks to go to the movie. I know I'm gonna get at least two big laughs. Like two, and that's that's worth twelve dollars. For for two really good Except Will Ferrell laughs. for Bewitched. I, I didn't see it. Okay. I, I, yeah, you don't need you to. You couldn't even. You don't need to. <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> yeah. I just saw that on cable recently, and that was a. Why did I do that one? Why moment? did you? I think it was. You know, it was a. Uh, um, it was like, oh, now let's try romantic comedy. And Nora Ephron, you sure, know, sure, big big deal. Yeah, yeah. Nicole Kidman, big deal. And I thought. Why Everything not? else has worked so far. Yeah. This will work. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> what about Land of the Lost? Land of the Lost is just, you know, the, the Monday morning quarterback on that one was we either needed to make a big, expensive right. kids movie yeah, or a weird, cheap 
low bud tongue and cheek tongue and cheek make and make it like the series right and we tried to do both and yeah. audience it's not horrible is it no no no. yeah i mean no it's actually part. if you if you if you go into it thinking it's going to be a, a family movie it's actually yeah. weird yeah it's a weird <laughs> funny movie if you, yeah. if you think if you think if you bring your kids you're going to be uncomfortable exactly, exactly. <laughs> and we ran up against the hangover yeah. the same weekend yeah That'll do it. <laughs> and and that, that was crazy, too, because those guys were, I mean, basically unknown. Like, no one knew who Zach Galifianakis was yet. Um, Ed Helms was just the, a side character in The Office. Uh, Bradley Cooper, I don't think, I, I don't think Bradley Cooper was a star at that point. Not um, what he is now. Sure. <laughs> so you see that movie dwarfing a Will Ferrell movie. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> but <laughs> but the, you know what? I think that is part of it, too. And he, obviously he realizes it. But I think there is something to be said for him saying, like, we didn't commit to one or the other. We thought we could just kind of do whatever we wanted. And you heard him say there about Bewitched, where he's like, well, hey, everything else has worked. Let's try a romantic comedy. It, he didn't. He never stayed in his wheelhouse, which you on the service have to give him credit for. But I think part of that did contribute to what we're talking about now, where he hasn't made a Will Ferrell level movie in, you know, 10 years. Yeah, I love when the uh, when they acknowledge how bad their movies are, though. So you can just kind of tell they're not phonies. Well, and he, the funny thing is, he brings it up. Yeah, maybe no, maybe knowing Marin was the type of guy that would bring it up. Yeah, because, because the way. By the way, I didn't leave it in because it just didn't fit the context. But the way that was set up was Marin saying, like, uh, you know, I find you funny even in movies where I know you're gonna bomb. <laughs> 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 and Will Ferrell's like, okay, <laughs> yeah, but the rocks but you gotta, like that too. Like The Rock will acknowledge when he has like a shit movie. Like he makes fun of uh, Doom all the time, which was notoriously bad. And I always just appreciate that they say something. Yeah, that, I mean that just makes you more likable when you hear these guys that take their roles very seriously and won't acknowledge that. It's like, well, there's also a metric for a bomb. You know what I mean? Like if the movie was supposed to make X amount of money and it did a quarter of that, that's wh whether you like the project or not. You know, you kind of have to acknowledge that it bombed. Right. Um. But yeah, like he is clearly aware of some of the uh, missteps that he made. And I think that's a good point about land of the lost where um, I think that was the example I used when I was talking about this on KMS, where that was the first movie where I was like, Oh, I'm excited to see it. And then uh, I was like, Oh, what, what is this? But maybe you go into it with the wrong mentality. I think that hurts a lot of movies too, where you're like, fuck yeah, a Will Ferrell movie. Whereas if I went into it thinking like, okay, let's see what this is. Maybe I would have enjoyed it more, you know? Yeah. Um, but next we do have him as Ron Burgundy on Colbert's show. Promoting his podcast. And this is where it's like, I mean, by the way, talk about two guys that have fallen off. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll, he'll, he'll, you'll hear Colbert even kind of like, trying his best to sell this but it was just a i so, think a poorly executed idea so that was uh, uh my question if we watch this is he also aware during this or is this part of the bit i don't know well let's hear it and, and diagnose it understanding and i did not know this and i didn't even know that you were in season two that you've got a podcast i do and what is yes. it called it's called the ron burgundy podcast <laughs> was any sort of <laughs> took you a while we're to come up with that name. Names. We're through a lot of names. We're through a lot of names. Yes. Uh, let's listen to this. Um, one, two, three. Action news. Um, uh, Catherine's ode to Catherine. Uh, Is there anyone named Catherine involved? No. Uh, and we just settled on the, the Ron Burgundy podcast. That sounds sense. Now, why a podcast? Because, I mean, this is your moneymaker. Sure. Why would you hide the moneymaker? Well, to tell you the truth, Stephen, I didn't know what a podcast was. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I got, I got kind of sold a bill of goods. Oh. Like that this right there. A, this is another thing where it's like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if Ron Burgundy did a podcast? Sure. He's actually doing one. Oh, well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to listen to it. <laughs> the idea is funnier. <laughs> yeah, the idea, the idea, he did a lot of things where, like, the idea is funnier than the execution of it, where, like, and, and you can hear it there in the interview, the ca this character needs to be written as well. You can't yeah. just improv and be Ron Burgundy. I, I understand it's Will Ferrell's character, but that's hard to do 
repetitively, <laughs> you know, for 13 episodes a year or whatever they were doing. And then in interviews, when you're trying to stay in character, yeah. like, that's very difficult to do. You could um, tell, you could tell though, when he said the name of the show and the crowd laughed, he wasn't expecting that to be a laugh. And well, that's I, also, I, I hated that bit. And that annoys me about Colbert where I hate the joke of like, Oh, how'd you come up with that name? I'm like, Oh, you call it the blind Mike project. How did you come up with that? Yeah. And then that yeah, kind of, puts we got him it. Cause it's my name. We got it. <laughs> yeah. And then he has to come up with something on the fly about the name and blah, blah. But like, my point was that bill of goods line. Like, was that real or was that part of the character? Well, it, it, here's what's interesting. That feels like something you would, an actor would do when he's fallen on hard times. Mm -hmm. I don't think Will Ferrell needed to do that podcast. No. And it was number one for a while. Like, I remember it was, it was, yeah, it was successful for a time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't, I personally don't get it, but it feels like something, you know, J Jaleel White would do the Urkel podcast or something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't feel like something Will Ferrell would be doing. And that's, that's the other thing. So now he's doing these things where that does matter at the end of the day, like what your image is. And it felt like Will Ferrell was a, became a guy that he'll do anything. He'll right. be in commercials. He'll do cameos on television. He'll do low budget movies. He'll do, he'll do whatever you ask him. And while that can be cool, if it's done well, I think that affects your image as well. Like look at Kevin Hart will do anything. Yeah. Does anyone, is there, has there been a project ever that, that you can think of where you're like, Oh, Kevin Hart's in this. I got to go see it. No, no cause he'll do <laughs> anything. He'll do whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so that I think became the tough thing. And the other reason um, I find that podcast to be an interesting point is there got to a point of the, in the career, right around that land of the lost era where it became, Oh, well let's try something we've already done. Let's bring back Ron Burgundy. Let's make a sequel to this movie. He was in the Zoolander sequel. Let's do thing. Let's rebrand things we've already done, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think it became a struggle. Like even we'll talk in a minute about he like, Oh, let's put him and John C. Riley together again. You know, let's, let's try the, uh, the Bush thing where I know that won a Tony award. I'm sure it was very good. But when he did a one man show of George Bush, it was, I think Obama was already in office by then. So it kind of became like, Oh, it's not a, and he mentions it in that Marin interview where he's like, it was kind of a skewering of George Bush to change the opinion of him. It's like, well, the guy was out of office already. Like, what does that do? You know? Yeah. So it became a thing where it's like, oh, you're doing that again from 10 years ago. You know? Yeah. I think the last movie he was in that wasn't just like a voice role that I enjoyed was uh, to a point. It wasn't my favorite, but Get Hard, I didn't hate. With, oh, uh, see, I look at that as one of the like the bo I actually look at that as, oh, well, let's put will ferrell and kevin hart together that'll have to be funny even if there's not really a script or yeah, yeah the the campaign let's hey zach galifianakis is hot right now let's put will ferrell and zach galifianakis together that'll be something that movie i i absolutely hated but i would say the the last hit that was just undeniably funny had to have been the other guys probably yes i think i think that's kind of the unanimous point where uh, well you know what i guess people liked um daddy's home and yeah, i think it made a lot of money so that's true that was a cast and a half, though. That was like a ton I'd, of I'd have to rewatch. But you know what? That's another example, even though it did well, I think. Um, that's another example of like, okay, well, he did well with Mark Wahlberg. Let's put him and Wahlberg together again. Yeah. You know, it felt like constantly there was this thing of like, well, hey, let's, it's not, nothing's working right now. Let's try something he did before. Yeah. That's the thing, too, is like, uh, saying like the other guys was the last movie he did that was just like, great i think that was one of his best movies ever i love that movie it's one sure, of my but that but that's 12 years ago now yeah i know i know well, more like almost 15 i think it was 2010 oh maybe yeah I, I was thinking 2012 but yeah you might be right yeah 2010 that's wow. crazy yeah crazy. but uh next this is a perfect example of let me check the reviews i'm not seeing this is uh um holmes and watson <laughs> Oh, so th this actually, I didn't realize that was the next one, but that this perfectly goes into what I'm talking about, where they're like, hey, remember, guys? Remember Talladega Nights and Step Brothers? We all have Step Brothers, right? Yeah. 
who decided who got who how did you decide who was going to be Holmes and who was going to be Watson? Well, at first we couldn't, so we'd shoot every other day switching parts. Mm -hmm. And then how long this is a great alternate version of the movie. So out there. cool. We have, uh -huh. we have like a month full of us switching, right. and then it was not cost productive. No, it really just make a decision. Let's just make a decision. <laughs> and I decided to be Sherlock. John is the amazing Dr. Watson. Uh-huh. Yes. Well, yes. if you saw Step Brothers, you know I lived in a house of learning. Thank you. Oh, you didn't. You didn't see it. <laughs> I in Step Brothers, I lived in a house of learned doctors. Yes. And in this movie, I get to play he a is learned doctor. Playing a learned doctor. A learned, yes. yes, yes. Maybe not quite as learned, but yes, a doctor <laughs> for sure. And so you guys, you went over to England. Did you yeah. know how to do an English accent beforehand, or was that something that you had to learn going in? Of course we knew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jimmy, Jimmy really selling it there. <laughs> that's, that's all he does now. That laugh, Kimmel. <laughs> that was, uh, I, I might come out on a list sometime, so I got to be nice. <laughs> well, that's not for this show. <laughs> I didn't say what list. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Like that even feels the way they're talking about it, like a thing that they bring up stepbrothers, you know, like if like, hey, guys, There's remember no reason for remember zero what we did that was really good together. <laughs> Imagine if that was this. <laughs> <laughs> so and now I'm glad they didn't try like a stepbrothers two or anything, but yeah. it is essentially at least the marketing of it was like, hey, these two guys are back together. Isn't that great? And that's the way I feel about the like him working with Wahlberg. Even though, like I said, I think that worked. Um, at least as far like my, I'd have to rewatch because Kirk said those were really funny. I'm, I I never saw the sequel, and I don't really remember the first one, so I'm gonna have to give those a rewatch. But I think they did pretty well. But you know what? That's an example. Let's say those movies are great. Mm -hmm. I actually think that's kind of an example of how what Will Ferrell has done to his reputation because you don't hear anyone talk about those really. Yeah, especially right. at the time they came out, no one was like, fuck yes, Daddy's Home is in theaters today. You know? I've still I've still not seen seen him at all. Um well maybe we'll do a watch for this uh we might have to. <laughs> we can this go back and retract our statements after this. <laughs> the litmus test. Yeah. Uh, all right, what else? Uh we have uh the uh Will Ferrell and McKay split. Yeah, so this is weird. At the time I remember thinking Boy, Will Ferrell's pretty delusional. And in hindsight, I think I'm on Team Ferrell now. But let's hear it explained, and then we'll talk about it. According to an interview with Vanity Fair, the two have not stayed in touch. McKay was working on an HBO limited series about the Los Angeles Lakers in the 1980s. Will Ferrell is a huge Lakers fan and was cast as Jerry Buss, the legendary manager of the team. There were some people involved who were like, we love Ferrell, he's a genius, but we can't see him doing it. John C. Riley was cast in his place. McKay wanted to be respectful and recast the role without telling Ferrell first. Riley, however, did because he's a stand up guy, says McKay. Not long after, the production company split, and according to McKay, although he's since reached out via email, he's yet to hear back from Farrell. In McKay's words, their last conversation was quite frosty. I said, well, I mean, we're splitting up the company. He basically was like, yeah, we are. And basically was like, have a good life. So it ended not well. Uh, so yeah, they, I mean, they made Funny or Die together. They made Eastbound and Down. They made a lot of funny stuff together that weren't necessarily like Will Farrell projects. Um, and then it just ended. And I remember when I first heard that, I was like, boy, Will Ferrell's gotten delusional because I think he would be a very bad Jerry Buss. Now, a lot of people have been critical of that show as well mm -hmm. and say it sucks, obviously. Um, but I just think John C. Riley is more equipped to play a guy that actually existed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like my image of Will Ferrell is, and I think that show was very over the top but will ferrell would be like this cartoonish i can't see him playing an nba owner you know <laughs> right i also think that's like a different argument for what happened though that's exactly right so that that's where my thinking kind of changed over time where i'm like oh you know what these guys worked together forever for 20 years or something they were partners in a company and adam mckay kind of went behind will ferrell's back and said oh we're doing we're using john c Riley for this we're gonna use one of your best friends instead 
Yeah, like that that is actually a pretty shitty way to handle it. And I get Will Ferrell say in my mind, I was like, oh, just because he's a big Lakers fan, he thinks he deserves that role. And then the more I think about it, I'm like, oh no, this is a business decision. He doesn't trust Adam McKay anymore. Yeah, and um, also it's like uh when was he gonna find out if John C. Riley didn't tell him? Right. Yeah, it, it sounded the way that's phrased at least, it sounded like something he would have found out in the tabloids that John C. Riley is doing this role, you know. Right. Um, so I think that's pretty shitty if they're business partners together. And they did eat the I forgot to mention uh, Eastbound and Down. Well, his role true. in East his role in Eastbound and Down is hysterical. Uh, so Ashley Schaefer of Ashley Schaefer's BMW. Yeah. <laughs> but that's another thing where it's like, yeah, he did that. That was really funny. But he was he was in a lot of the stuff that they produced. Like he was in um I think it was called The Goods Live Hard, Sell Hard with Jeremy Piven. I love that movie. Which I yeah, I thought it was like an underrated comedy. I saw it in theaters at the time and I kind of enjoyed it. But I remember thinking, like, that's a weird role for Will Ferrell to appear. Like he was just in one scene. Yeah, and I think there became a lot of those, you know, where it's like, why is Will Ferrell in this? You I know? also think that's where he's kind of the strongest, though. He's in and out. He's funny. Like uh, he was sure, in Tim small Eric's, doses. Yeah, he yeah. was in Tim and Eric's billion dollar movie. And uh, he was the owner of the mall that they were purchasing. And yeah. for them to buy it, he made them watch Top Gun four times in a row. It was very funny. Yeah. But then he's out of the movie. Now, there are some like underrated Will Ferrell. Pro- like, I think Blades of Glory is a hilarious movie. So funny. I love but you could all, then you could also argue he's just playing Ricky Bobby on ice skates, basically, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so th- there's some of that. But like, there are some underrated Will Ferrell projects, and there are some things I do like him in during this time. Um, but overall, he he's not the same. And I also think it's hard, like, name a comedic talent who was in great movies for 30 years. That's 20, still alive. 20, 20 yeah, years even. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say that's still alive. <laughs> no, no, no. I, but like Steve Martin all of a sudden started doing family movies. Uh, Eddie Murphy, same thing. Standler really fell off. Jim Carrey started taking himself too seriously. Yeah. Like name a, a guy that was at that level, you know? Yeah, Belushi perfect, died, <laughs> you know? It's a, it's a perfect um, Chris Farley argument. Like what would he have done? Right. Yeah. And that and that's I think the argument a lot of people make is like he would have been Kevin James eventually. Like he would have been doing, you know, Paul Blart or something. Probably would have um, made a better movie. Maybe. But but that's the thing is maybe not. Because it what I think it's hard to expose these guys because it becomes well, I've seen this already in a different form. Or as you get older, like with uh, Eddie Murphy and Steve Martin. I don't know. They take easier projects or they want to do family friendly. That's what happened with Sandler too, is he wanted Sandler wanted to do movies his kids could watch, which that's great, but I don't give a shit about watching it, you know? Right. Right. Um, so yeah, it, I think it's tough in general. We could do, we could do this kind of episode, like I said, about a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not necessarily exclusive to Will Ferrell. I think comedy in general, and even look at stand up, like Carlin got very serious late in his life, you know? Like the, yeah. it's Ch- Chappelle now, I think it's hard to be funny over and over again. And we talked about this in the Mitch Hedberg episode where like Mitch Hedberg, legendary joke writer. I think if he puts out five more specials, like the magic trick starts to evaporate. You kind of, you start to know his thinking, you know where he's going with a joke. <laughs> so the element of surprise is gone. It becomes less funny. And I think that's a lot of, uh, the Will Ferrell effect. You're saying you're you're glad he did heroin, like for his le- for his legacy, yes. Yeah, <laughs> but like a, a perfectly comparable episode that we could do like this would be Sandler, Sandler, Jim Carrey as well. Yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, and I, I think I just named all the like Eddie Murphy and Steve Martin too. We could do this, um, but but I will say Steve Martin, like when I see him around, is still funny at times. Yeah, and. Eddie Murphy is kind of more serious, but lately every appearance has been kind of more the the jokey Eddie Murphy because he went from mega famous comedian and then just did a couple of movies that went over well, um, you know, like the family movies. Like after the Nutty Professor, that was kind of like, what are you doing? You know, you know who's well. I'm trying to think of the last thing he's done, but like Ben Stiller had a long underrated. You don't think of Ben Stiller in this category? True. But, you know, like you could list the amount of very funny movies. But now even now that I'm saying his name, 
it's been at least 10 years since I have liked anything he's done, right? Tropic Thunder maybe might be the last one, so 15 years. That's a long one. That's a long time ago. Yeah, but he he's even... I don't know if he's necessarily done something that I've been like, why in the fuck? Zoolander 2. Was it that bad? I haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we are, uh, you know, we're pro Will Ferrell here. We're rooting for him to make a comeback. And I say comeback again. He was in the biggest fucking movie ever with Barbie. Right. So, so, but it's weird to be like, yeah, Will Ferrell's like, I don't know, the third or fourth lead in that. And it, it's a role that kind of, to be fair, uh, my girlfriend was, I was half watching it as it was on the TV. Mm-hmm. But every time I saw Will Ferrell pop on the screen, I was like, I feel like anyone could, that's not a Will Ferrell role. Yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot of what happens in like the, you know, the way we look at him is those Ron Burgundy appearances in like a few months ago, him and John C. Ryler singing boats and hose with Snoop Dogg. Yeah. You know, it's like, don't do that. Where, yeah. When you see Will Ferrell now, there's a lot of like, Oh, oh yeah. That's, just, you know what I mean? It didn't used to be like that. Yeah. And he just was a DJ at some frat party too. Overexposure. That's Correct. probably that's probably our main diagnosis. And I, I do think once I realized that thing about the office, I'm I think that that feeling, I'm not saying that exact moment, that role, whatever, mm-hmm. but that feeling of why is he here? <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't his fault. <laughs> no, it's not his fault. He was doing something nice for them. He's lending his name to that season. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it, it, that feeling of why is he here is what sticks with you with Will <laughs> Ferrell a lot. And yeah, it's every t- when he pops up on late night, like Conan and uh, Andy Richter, I heard say this. And I think Conan was like, threw Will Ferrell's name out there, but then rightly said, Norm MacDonald, the best guest we ever had. And Andy Richter's answer was Will Ferrell. And I was like, how do you look at what those two guys did on that show? It's so clear to me that Norm was... The, I mean, one of the greatest talk show guests ever. Yeah. Whereas Will Ferrell, it was kind of like, why is he do like Will Ferrell was on the last um, Conan Tonight Show. Mm-hmm. He's like playing the the fucking drums or something. Was he saying it just to not have the same answer? Probably. I don't know. It's like, possible, how could you, but... you? You can't go against. Well, him. Andy Richter was bullied by Norm, so <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> very true. But speaking of Norm, our favorite. Speaking segment. of Norm, we do have one more. Yes, I do. Have a, we haven't been able to do it in a while, so I should explain. We like to wedge Norm into episodes anytime we can, even if it doesn't really apply. <laughs> uh, so this is pretty loosely uh, associated with Will Ferrell. It's Will Ferrell telling a uh, Norm McDonald story, and I think it might be attached to another great Jim Brewer story we played in the um, SNL Fires Norm MacDonald episode where uh, Norm had, him and Chris Kattan would constantly butt heads. Norm speculated that Chris been, may, may have been living a life in the closet, possibly. <laughs> I don't know where he came up with that idea, but he would like to fuck with Chris Kattan, and so this is uh, Will Ferrell telling a, a related story. Norm, another great Norm story has nothing to do with yeah. Trebek. <laughs> <laughs> was and Catan told me about it. They were on a flight together mm-hmm. back LA to New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris had taken off his shoes uh, and he can't find his shoes. They're about to <laughs> land. Can't find his shoes. He's yeah, going gonna, to killing. the flight attendant. Have you seen my shoes? I took them off. It's like, I don't know. He's like, Catan's like, Norm, come on. <laughs> you took my shoes. No, I didn't. I didn't well, take your yeah. shoes. Why would I take your shoes? It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I've never taken that. Wouldn't it? <laughs> He's like, come on, give me back my shoes. I know you took them. I know. Norm's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Catan has to walk through JFK <laughs> with no shoes. With no shoes, just in his yeah. socks. <laughs> An entire season goes by. <laughs> and then. Catan and Norm are jousting back and yeah, forth they about were, something. Yeah, they used to joust a little and bit. And then yeah. Norm finally goes, oh, yeah, and one other thing, I did take your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that flight in November. Flight in November. <laughs> I took them, I threw them in the trash can, just so you know. <laughs> he may have never told him. I know. <laughs> it was a bit just for Norm. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, I love the uh, the Norm Chris Catan stories are very funny. And Will did a pretty good Catan there too. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Norm. <laughs> yeah, they were they were like they were pretty close those two. Uh, Will Ferrell and Chris Catan. Oh yeah, like inseparable. <laughs> Is that right? I feel like they were always paired together. No, well, I know. I mean, specifically in uh, well, not the Roxbury. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, I don't know. That's how how I see the downfall of Will Ferrell. Let me know what you guys think. Light up that comment section. Sound off. Maybe you disagree with me. Show some fire in there. Or uh, let me know if I missed anything. If there are any projects you think contributed to the downfall of Will Ferrell, leave a comment. Let us know. Um, sound we're, off. They're probably going to mention uh, Eastbound and Down. We did. Just remember, we we mentioned it, everybody. Oh, but I love East. I love him in Eastbound. I think that's a great character. Oh, it's the best. The whole thing. The whole entire show. Um, well, it falls off a little bit, but, but that's for another day. Yeah. <laughs> so, but for now, uh, yeah, you know what? Let us know what you think about Eastbound and Down in the comments as well. And the best place to find this program on all platforms would be blindmike.net. Uh, you get all the free links there, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get podcasts, um, as well as the YouTube. Um, make sure you interact with the show, comment, leave reviews, all that good stuff. And uh, if you want to support the show even further, then become a member. You get uh, bonus episodes as well as early access to these episodes. So uh, subscribe either on Patreon or YouTube. Become a member. Support the show. We appreciate it. Uh, get us to 1,000 on Patreon, will you? But it's yeah. been looming over us for some time. So uh, <laughs> let's hit that, that milestone. And um, we appreciate you guys. Thanks for all the support. Um, Oh, and uh, verygoodshow.org is where you can support Craigers. Isn't that yeah, right? That's right. If you're listening to this for free, yesterday uh, a new episode of Rubbed Out came out. Um, we talked about it's in a similar format to this one, matter of fact. I've noticed. Uh, <laughs> uh, we talked about uh, this rapper, Big Lurch, who ate his friend's uh, girlfriend, and it's disgusting. So check Eight. it out. Yes. Yep. Not like ate her out, like con consumed her. Yeah, he was caught in the street naked holding her lung. Oh, yeah, it's gross. Well, find out about that. Yeah, it's a true crime podcast. If you're wondering, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not uh, it's not sexual in nature. I don't it's think not sexual in nature. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, go check out uh, Craig's stuff and uh, support the boys, will you? And uh, we appreciate it. Until next time, we will talk to you guys later on why you laughing. Zip it up and zip it out. <laughs>